Okay, this is just uh, to remind everybody before you attend the scientific uh, uh, talk that, you know, things are real. That things are, those that are real are real. Those that just look alike, maybe they are not. So there are several stories that start with a certain idea how they should be, but then science drives you somewhere else and maybe, you know, you discover other things. So just be, be curious. Okay, so what I'm trying to, to talk about today is the following, is uh, putting together two very fashionable words, keywords. One is the non-coding genome or non-coding RNA. The other one is the epigenome regulation. <coughs> now, uh, there's a lot uh, of talking about epigenetics and epigenome in general. So everything now is epigenetics, uh, whatever deals with uh, uh, gene regulation complexity, people refer to epigenetics. But perhaps uh, a few words should be spent to uh, define what we mean by epigenetics or what we mean by the epigenome and when these uh, concepts are really useful to uh, drive our, our science. So the epigenome, I will define it at the molecular level later, but let's say it's what we can consider being the molecular interface that allows the genome to interact with the environment and basically record at the level of chromatin structure or chromosome structure what is the biological experience of our cells and our individuals, okay? This determines um, uh, phenotypic variability because uh, each of us experiences uh, life in different ways, even if we are genetic identical, like twins, for example. Nevertheless, we um, express uh, phenotypic variability in the absence of uh, genetic variability. Now, this being this, this is very important that for cell or for organism as such, that these characteristics are well maintained, for example, through, through cell division, and in some cases also through, um, through uh, generations in some cases. So we're talking about structures that uh, imprint in the chromosome what we learn from the environment and what we need to know to, to face up to, the, uh, to life, in a way. So, inheritance, this is what epigenetics is about. Epigenome is what gene complexity, gene regulation complexity is at the level of the chromatin. So, from the molecular <coughs> point of view, the epigenome comprises not just chromatin. If you can have, maybe, oh, the lights, maybe not now, okay. Um, various levels of uh, genome organization. So everybody is uh, familiar with the uh, nucleosome modifications, acetylation, methylation, and so on, DNA methylation, but also other so-called higher order levels of organization of chromosomes inside nuclei matter for the stability and quality of a transcription program, for example, hence for cell identity maintenance. Now, a new key player is coming now up very uh, <clears throat> brutally, so to speak, to attention. This is non-coding RNA. Non-coding RNA uh, appears to be a key player in all these levels of uh, regulation of what we can call the epigenome. So non-coding RNA, short or long, have been implicating, for example, in driving the binding of uh, chromatin modifying machineries at, uh, at, uh, in the genome to be required, for example, to uh, condense chromatin or heterochromatin information, as we'll see later, and also drive, for example, DNA methylation and other things. So this uh, comes from the seminal works published a couple of years ago that report the fact that basically the, the entire genome is transcribed or is producing basically RNA. Now the function of this RNA, we know that only 5% of this is actually translated into proteins, the rest has, no, has virtually no, no clear function. So clearly there's a, a major effort in terms of developing new technologies and basically also new concepts to try to understand what is the function of uh, uh, the output of the uh, non-coding output of the, of the mammalian genome. So one aspect, for example, is uh, the importance of producing non-coding RNA at regions in the genome that were defined, classically defined as the silent. And I'm referring in particular to heterochromatin. Heterochromatin this is composed basically by repeat elements, by definition non-coding, as, as at the level of DNA already. 
Now, a complex series of events that include the production of transcripts, uh, non-coding transcripts from uh, repeat elements. These drive the uh, being then processed by uh, um, RNAi machinery, and we will talk about RNAi machinery in, uh, extensively later in a while in the talk. Now, the production of short RNA is the necessary for uh, to trigger the um, recruitment <coughs> at the level of chromatin of chromatin modifying enzymes that then set up the bona fide um, uh, heterochromatin structure by methylating histones and so on. So I'm, I'm not going to the details of heterochromatin formation, but the take home message here is that uh, silenced domains are in fact transcribed and you need transcription in order to produce non coding RNA. The test non coding RNA is important for the formation and the, of the uh, proper chromatin and epigenetic structure here. So this type of transcription is also cell cycle regulated. So e all these events uh, have to be also placed in time, not only in space. And so for what matters for inheritance, epigenetic inheritance at the level of heterochromatin formation, what uh, a couple of labs show is that the production of non-coding RNA occurs at a very specific time of uh, cell cycle in particular the during S phase, and then this transcription is important for the reformation and inheritance of a chromatin structure, therefore um, uh, genome stability ultimately. Now, what is the contribution of RNAi in this business? So everybody is very familiar with the role of RNAi. Most of you maybe use RNAi in the lab to produce, to knock down your protein of interest and do pseudogenetics, okay? Knock it down and lo look at phenotypes. Now, what you do is you deliver uh, double-stranded RNA against a given target RNA, and then this triggers the degradation of the target RNA, and everybody's happy with that. Now, what in the few past, past few years is coming up to the attention of people is that there is also another level, potential level of regulation uh, driven by um, um, RNAi machinery or short RNA to start with, acting in the nucleus. And this would be acting at the transcription level. So there is evidence, a uh, few papers scattered in the literature, that tell how short RNA targeting specific sequences of promoters, for example, of uh, kind of uh, interesting genes like tumor suppressor genes and so on, trigger uh, a cascade of events that lead, for example, to either silencing or even activation of those promoters in a sequence specific manner. This is a very powerful tool to uh, directly influence the activity of a specific gene and a guarantee that this gene changes, switches from a state to the other and then is inherited also in the new state. But still, it's a black box, it's a complete mystery how this happens. So the open question here is uh, what is the role of RNAi, if any, in chromatin, in the nucleus? So I wanted to tell you, we've got two stories uh, first in, uh, in Drosophila and then in human cells that led us to uh, something completely unexpected, so to speak, about the role of RNAi in nuclei. So first of all, we started with uh, uh, the uh, investigation whether RNAi components would be um, compartmentalized also in the nucleus, not only in the cytoplasm. These are nuclear extracts, they're cytoplasmic extracts from Drosophila embryonic cells or, or tissue culture cells and you see that Dicer2, Argonaut1 uh, or Argonaut2 are not only present clearly in the nucleus, but they are quite, kind of prominently present in nuclei of, uh, of these cells. Then this is a chromatin fractionation type of experiments. I don't go into the details of this, but you can basically uh, separate chroma the chromatin from the nucleoplasm and from the rest of, of the cells and uh, ask the question what, what if your product of interest is specifically enriched in this fraction or not. And you can see that basically Argonaut Dicer in particular, these are the former complex, uh, are, are clearly associated with, uh, with chromatin. Whereas Dicer 1, which is uh, mostly uh, involved in the production of microRNA, is not. Okay. So <coughs> then we take a, took advantage from uh, uh, what is uh, very, very useful in Drosophila, the polythene chromosomes. Uh, polythene chromosomes allow you to uh, uh, have at a glance the distribution of a protein in the genome at a certain resolution. Um, so we probe this, uh, and I apologize for the light, but you know, I think this is uh, because of the video. So um, 
you can probe uh, polyton chromosomes. So these are probed with argonaut uh, protein itself. And the take home message here, you see these all, all these discrete bands here, uh, that argonaut protein is uh, strongly associated with chromatin, but it's also associated with uh, unexpected parts of the chromosomes, and these are the interbands. Now, interbands cytologically are defined as regions uh, which are decondensed, so actively transcribed. So here it was the first surprise, RNAi being uh, associated not with heterochromatin, not with silenced regions of the genome, but rather with actively transcribed regions of the genome. The same for Dicer. Dicer here uh, is this, this uh, picture uh, features the, the distribution of Dicer throughout chromosomes uh, and the colocalization also with POL2, but all in particular also with chromosomal PAFs. So chromosomal PAFs are, are sites of a heavy transcription in, uh, in the genome. Now, the presence of argonaut proteins or Dicer proteins as chromosomal PAFs was kind of a, a ringing bell for uh, uh, effects on the transcription of, uh, of uh, Hitchcock genes, for example, or inducible genes in general. So we looked into mutants for Dicer or argonaut and t uh, for the relative condens condensation state of these uh, particular loci. And what we found compared to wild type, these are fish probes for the uh, Hitchcock loci here, is that in these loci, in, in, in these mutants, these loci are in fact decondensed without any induction. So this was an in the first indication of a transcription a defect uh, for, for these particular genes. This was confirmed by RT-PCR, so either in larvae or in Schneider cells, where we deplete actually the cells uh, for Dicer or argonaut. You see that the prior, even in, without any induction, all these genes are upregulated uh, in, the, in the case of uh, defective for RNAi. Now we can show that this is specific for RNAi defect, that we can re basically rescue the defect by delivering wild type copies of argonaut or Dicer to the cells and restore basically the normal levels of, uh, of expression. So this is coming to uh, one important uh, thing in uh, biology of chromosomes. This is regulation of POL2. Uh, and in particular, POL2, uh, sorry, e chalk promoters. e chalk promoters have been known for, for many years being kind of unique case, you know, kind of uh, exception to the rule, whatever rule uh, was not clear. So the rule was, uh, the exception was to have a, a, a repressed gene, like in the uninduced conditions, having a post pole 2 um, fixed at the promoter here, waiting for the induction, waiting for transcription factors, kicking the pol polymerase to go, okay? Now this is uh, regulated by a number of factors, for example, NELF, it's a negative elongation factor, if you get rid of NELF, POL2 then is uh, released for going and then starts trans the transcription process. So uh, characteristic of this uh, uh, post-POL2 is the fact that it occupies a very specific nucleotide in the, in, the, in the promoter, so you can measure whether there is any defect in POL2 positioning, for example. So that's what we, we observe. So by chromatin immunoprecipitation, one can uh, test where is pol 2 uh, in, in, in the promoter, of course. But in Dicer, for example, mutants or Ar Argonaut mutants uh, measure what is the relative amount of pol 2 at the promoter, transcription start site, versus the amount of pol 2 that is found in the gene body. So these are not simply chromatin IP uh, mapping uh, data. These are, these are measuring what is the relative amount of pol 2 which is present here uh, 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 compared to what you, you find uh, in, the, in the promoter region here. So there is a clear defect uh, in, the, in this case. Uh, you can also measure the, at the nucleotide level uh, the, uh, the position of POL2 uh, at the promoter here by permanganate. These are classic uh, uh, experiments, permanganate footprinting. And uh, what we can see here in the quantification is that in fact, uh, POL2 in Dicer mutants or argonaut mutants is not shown here. Uh, the amount of protein here in uh, POL2 interacting with the transcription start site is clearly reduced. So there is a, a fundamental derangement of POL2 positioning. This is true not only for each um, of genes, which are special quotation marks, but also for genes that contain post POL2, but are not inducible genes. So there is a global defect in uh, POL2 positioning 
in Dicer or Argonaut Mutant at promoters. Now, whether this is direct or indirect for RNAi complex, so we can show that in fact Pol uh, Argonaut or Dicer complex are present together with Pol2 at, uh, uh, at the promoter regions uh, of uh, the Hitchcock genes in particular. But importantly, we can uh, show that uh, Pol2 is actually interacting directly with Argonaut or, or, or Dicer uh, in co-precipitation experiments. But then <coughs> if we deplete cells for Dicer or Argonaut, um, the complex between RNAi complex and Pol2 is released. And what is also released is the interaction with the negative elongation factor here. The, the factor that is important to maintain, to keep Pol2 uh, from, from going, inhibiting Pol2. So the, comp the RNAi Pol2 uh, interaction is important to maintain Pol2 interacting with the, the negative elongation factors. So what about short RNA? Still the mystery. So we can pull down argonaut proteins from nuclei and deep seek uh, the short RNA, which is associated with the, with the argonaut protein, and ask the question, uh, uh, is there any RNA, short <coughs> RNA, that uh, would be associated with argonaut that would be also present in the uh, body of the gene or promoter regions of the Hitchcock genes, for example? Now, this is a, a typical experiment. Uh, where we indeed we find short RNA, which is, uh, can be mapped at the Hitchcock uh, gene promoters. But frankly speaking, we cannot find a clear um, correspondence with the promoter regions or any other regulatory region of the, of the Hitchcock gene in particular. We just, this, this information is only telling us that there is RNA coming, uh, being associated with the argonaut complex, but that this RNA is representative of sequences in the, uh, in the Hitchcock gene body, but is not clearly associated with uh, the transcription state of the gene per se. So this is clearly still, uh, still a mystery what the short RNA would be doing. So to ask the question more mechanistically whether the defined known uh, enzymatic activities of RNAi are in fact involved in nuclei, in the transcription phenotype we see, we took advantage from um, uh, specific mutants, point mutants available in Drosophila that affect, for example, dicer dicing uh, activity or argonaut slicing activity or dicer helicase activity. Now, in all these cases, uh, there is a particular phenotype, but uh, Interestingly, what we found is that all these mutants affect the ability of cells to respond to stress. And to respond to stress and to do it via polymerase too. So in this experiment, what you see, this is a, um, a classic experiment where you can visualize actually the mobilization of Pol2, quantitative mobilization of Pol2 in uh, wild type cells from all euchromatic sites. When you stress cells, Pol2 transcription is inhibited and Pol2 is concentrated only on the Hitchcock loci, so on the emergency gene loci. Now, if we repeat the same experiment in Argonaut or Dicer mutants, so this is not the case. So the entire stress response of the cell is impaired. Pol2 is not mobilized from the target genes, and the, the silencing that accompanies normally the stress response is, uh, is affected. So this is a kind of global <coughs> and pretty dramatic phenotype. Now, this is really complicated, but the, um, the specific phenotype referred to loss of, tra of transcription regulation at the level of Hitchcock genes requires argonaut slicing activity, requires dicer helicase activity, and we'll comment on this in a second, but it does not require dicing activities from dicer. So this anticipates also um, um, results that could be difficult to interpret, namely if one would look simply for short RNA produced by Dicer looking for 21, 22 nucleotides being potentially involved in these processes may fa simply fail because in fact there is no indication that Dicer activity would be required to produce such RNA. So maybe Dicer would be doing something else, probably doing the helicase uh, activity, using delicase activity. We will see in a second what, I'm, what, I, what I mean by that. So. 
the take home message here is that RNAi complex is in fact uh, uh, operating in nuclei quantitatively. It's unexpectedly o operating at the level of promoters, of active promoters in general, and it will be actually uh, operating by controlling directly POL2 um, uh, regulation at uh, uh, posing in particular at, uh, at core promoters. Now, regulation of POL2, you see we are drifting away from epigenetics. You know, you know which POL2, was, has, has POL2 anything to do with epigenetics? I think it does. Uh, stability of transcription complexes that promote the regions being inherited from one cell ge generation to the other is epigenetics, okay? So POL2 may be part of this, not simply histone methylation. And fact, POL2 being associated with the promoters uh, uh, throughout the genome, even promoters that are not uh, transcriptionally active, is now cl pretty clear coming out from chip on chip or chip sec type of data. So there's a lot of gene regulation uh, taking place at the level of uh, POL2 machineries uh, uh, in the cell that uh, the cell has to deal with. And probably RNAi, uh, which is normally uh, kind of an emergency uh, system to protect the cells uh, from, from in, uh, infections or invasions of nucleic acid from outside, acting in the cytoplasm. It also operates probably in the nucleus by uh, regulating POL2 and stress response in particular. So, as I said, in summary, dyes are, uh, are associated with chromatin. They localize at euchromatic sites and not with the silence domains. They interact with POL2. They, they regulate POL2 correct positioning at promoters, uh, and they may control also stress uh, by controlling globally POL2 machinery in the cell. Now, what about non-coding RNA? So these are just two papers, but there are another two or three that came out in the last four, three, four months. These papers are telling us something completely new, namely that not short RNA, but long intergenic RNA or long non-coding RNA play a major role in, uh, in reprogramming cells or regulating cell identity or regulating, for example, cell transformation and, uh, or homeotic genes and others. So based on uh, bioinformatic criteria and also other criteria, uh, laboratory, for example, of John Rin identified uh, one class, but there are other classes of long non-coding, intergenic non-coding RNA that in, uh, are capable to uh, do what transcription factors actually do. This is, I think, a uh, kind of spectacular paper that came out uh, like a couple of weeks ago, where uh, using, uh, studying IPS um, production in vitro, the authors here postula postulated <coughs> that uh, the stochastic process that normally accompanies the ability of cell somatic cell reprogramming um, could be driven or enhanced by also non-coding RNA that would be part of transcription complexes. So cooperating with transcription factors uh, like OCT4, NANOG, or SOX, and so on. So they isolated a couple of, of these uh, 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 non-coding RNA, and they delivered this RNA to cells, and cells are actually reprogrammed. So this is a demonstration that non-coding non RNA is basically uh, as, as important as transcription factors in defining cell, cell programs and so on. So um, when we're looking for um, what will be the target of RNAi complexes in chromatin at promoters, we should keep this in mind. So short RNA, if any, could be produced in cis. So the, the Argonaut pulled down experiment deep sequencing of uh, short RNA, trying to map the short RNA in the genome and try to understand whether this RNA correlates with uh, transcription state of genes or whatever. This would be the, the easiest way of identifying this RNA. But this is apparently is not the case. So by looking at several databases that we produce and other produce, there's no obvious, obvious uh, correlation between uh, this short RNA that people find and, uh, for example, promoter activity in general. So another possibility is that what uh, we, we are dealing with is a more complex scenario in which uh, the real target of RNAi machineries at promoters are no, non-coding RNA that will be produced elsewhere, acting in trans, and then influencing the activity of POL2 or transcription factors in many other ways. <coughs> so this to, to say the following, that if we simply look for RNA uh, by deep sequencing, and we would tr try to al align the sequence of this RNA to this promoter sequence, we would never see it. 
because this, this sequence here has nothing to do with the target promoter here, okay? So we have to do, uh, you know, we have to devise technologies that allow us to pull down transcription complexes, um, figure out what RNA is associated with, with these uh, transcription complexes, and then test functionally uh, for, for their activity. So we kind of believe that RNAi is actually targeting such molecules. One example is SINE-B2 RNA. SINE-B2 has been shown, is a repetitive sequence, uh, has been shown to directly <coughs> influence POL2 by basically inhibiting POL2. So having an RNA, uh, RNA's function here that regulates SINE-B2 stability in POL2 uh, complex would, be, would have a, a tremendous impact in uh, POL2 regulation. But this is something we, we are working on for the future. So, what about human cells? Human cells, to cut the long story short, show the similar, same picture. This is a, a chip seek uh, uh, analysis of Dicer, and the Argonaut looks uh, basically identical. Uh, so, this is the gene body, 5 prime or 3 prime end, and this is the relative uh, um, uh, expression state of the gene. Okay? So, the more the gene is active, the higher is active, the more po Dicer or Argonaut are found here, uh, this is intermediate activation, this is low level activation, this is silencing, okay? So again, there is no association with RNAi with silenced domains. And the bulk of, uh, uh, of binding is, is found at the transcription start site and a little bit at the 3' end of the gene, so like in Drosophila. Also, uh, POL2 and specific isoforms of POL2 are co-precipitated with the Dicer or Argonaut like, like in the Drosophila case. Now, um, we looked also at the uh, defects in POL2 positioning here in, uh, in the human cells, and we come to, by different means, we come to a similar conclusion. So we, we found that Dicer seems to prefer active genes, as I said, but also active genes that have bidirectional promoters. Bidirectional promoters, these are characteristic promoters of uh, uh, human cells, or mouse cells, that from coding, have a non-coding transcription unit going in the other direction. Great, so potential, non, uh, potential double stranded RNA. Not the case, because these, those uh, sense antisense transcripts are never, uh, nevertheless n preferred by Dicer, are nevertheless non overlapping, so no way to produce short RNA, a double stranded RNA. Nevertheless, the, the distance, we're talking about few nucleotides, ten, with 10 base pairs, regular spacing. Okay, this is a structural characteristic of chromatin. <coughs> The spacing between these transcription start sites is perturbed, severely is perturbed in Dicer knockdown or Argonaut uh, cells. Namely, two base pairs in particular are uh, difference in the position of pole tube and the start site of the, of the promoter is observed in, the, in tata, tata plus or tata minus, uh, sorry, tata minus uh, less in uh, tata plus cells, in tata plus promoters and so on. So POL2 is deregulated, in, uh, it's not capable to start transcription uh, in the proper way, genome-wide, in, uh, in human cells. Now I'm coming to a second part of the talk, uh, little by little, which is going to um, deal with uh, the contribution of uh, repetitive elements um, to epigenome regulation and cell identity to some extent. Now, by analyzing the target size of Dicer and Argonaut uh, by ChIP-seq, what we observe is that um, line elements uh, or sign elements, but in particular line elements, are pretty, pretty strongly represented in, uh, in the binding sites of, uh, of these proteins in the genome, together with the you know, active genes and so on. But we know the line elements, for example, are in fact transcribed and are part of transcription program of, uh, of these cells. I can skip this. Now, RNAi is uh, well known uh, to have a very specific phenotype in, uh, in uh, for example, in yeast cells or in plant cells. Mutants for RNAi show a strong defect in uh, transposable elements uh, regulation. So, defects in Dicer or Argonaut, uh, defective cells, transposable elements start to jump around because they lose methylation, because they lose uh, transcriptional control. So, and uh, 
normally transcription of repetitive elements and mobilization of repetitive elements is um, accompanied by, is, uh, follows basically stress response. So we believe that RNAi major uh, role in the, in the genome is to control in particular repeat elements transcription and most probably repeat elements uh, mobilization in the cell. Now mobilization of uh, repeat elements uh, is something that is coming up now and again something completely unexpected uh, is, uh, is gaining attention. So everybody knows from you know, the classic work of uh, Barbara McClintock about the importance of repetitive elements in producing uh, you know, gene variabil genome variability and so on. These are uh, modular elements that enable uh, these modules to move around, to jump around from one side to the other of the genome, simply encoding the two or three factors that are, that are important for, for their regulation. Now, uh, the human genome is actually comprised 45% by these elements. And up to now, the whole genomics and transcriptomics and so on has completely um, neglected this part of the genome. This genome has no virtual function at the moment, also because of uh, uh, technical, technical <coughs> reasons here. But you see that the numbers are pretty, pretty dramatic. So the, there are hundreds of thousands of copies of either full length or um, truncated uh, versions of, uh, of these elements that are spread out in the genome. And we know now that these, uh, from these elements there are specific transcripts that are, uh, that are made, but the function of these elements uh, uh, in, the, in the, the cell level is uh, completely, completely unknown. So I don't think I have to go too much into the details, but uh, just to remind you the fact that these elements can move. This is pretty well known in germ cells in particular. They can move around. But when they move around, so the, the, their RNA is produced, goes into the cytoplasm, but then uh, uh, following a number of uh, specific reactions involving also DNA repair and so on, uh, truncated forms of the, of the original uh, um, genomic element are then inserted into the, the genome. And either 5 prime end or 3 prime end, both containing promoters actually, are then found throughout the genome, uh, the human cells in particular. Now, um, this means that what you're bringing about in the genome are promoters. Now, promoters are probably the most potent piece of DNA that, you know, having a nice, uh, hi highly or organized topologically speaking and so on, chromosomal domain and program and so on. When you put a promoter in the middle of, of this game, for sure something is going to happen. For example, disturbing an answer promoter or silencing promoter uh, interactions and so on. In addition, disturbing, for example, uh, <coughs> the processivity of mRNA production, like in splicing and so on. These are a few cases. Cases in which uh, you may have a transduction, you may have mRNA splicing stability by adding, for example, uh, pieces of unwanted sequence to, to the primary transcript. You can invade genes or neighboring genes with sense-antisense uh, transcripts that then can have a potent effect on, on the stability of transcription complexes uh, uh, in those particular regions and ultimately end up in changes in uh, epigen epigenome structure of those, uh, of those regions having an impact on the epigenetic stability of, uh, of the program. <coughs> now, it's well known, in fact, that uh, mobilization of uh, repeat elements in any system uh, has a, a strong impact on, on gene regulation. Uh, you're looking for variegated phenotypes in flowers, variegated phenotypes in, uh, in mice fur color, uh, onset of diseases, uh, and, other, and other examples. So one has to really put strong attention to the regulation of these elements, how they move around. There's another interesting correlation that the, 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 the higher we go with the uh, evolution, the higher the contribution of a non-coding RNA, and in particular, the relative amount of repeat elements is. Uh, so most probably, these are the elements that 
make the difference in uh, in uh, in creating um, in creating variability in uh, in our in nature. So this is a list of uh, diseases that people have uh, identified being um, associated with uh, defects in uh, repetitive elements, stability or insertions uh, in particular. And one example uh, we are interested in, for example, the, the, in the dystrophin gene, which uh, is accompanied by uh, specific sense or antisense uh, changes uh, due to uh, line, lines uh, uh, insertions. So, what is the role of transcription and mobilization of repetitive elements in human biology? These are big questions. Could they, in fact, contribute to epigenetic regulation and, you know, cell, cell programs, actually? So we, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Piero Carnici, uh, a couple of years ago, we um, um, published that, in fact, repetitive elements are transcribed. They are transcribed in a tissue-specific manner. So each cell type uh, produces transcripts from repetitive elements. But these transcripts are not just random, it's not just noise. These transcripts are clearly cell type specific. So there is a program underlying uh, the production of transcripts here. Their re relative abundance is quite kind of low, but uh, they happen to be uh, expressed uh, in combination with the expression of genes that are, happen to be in the vicinity of, uh, of, uh, of these repetitive elements. So, Wherever you have an active gene, you may have a, a repetitive element, a promoter ele of these elements being also transcribed. And that is a, one is thinking of a co-regulation between, uh, uh, between transcripts. Now, x inactivation, the classic Mary Lyon uh, hypothesis that uh, due to the imbalance of uh, line elements present in uh, X chromosome, um, you may have uh, a role of lines uh, in uh, uh, guiding which of the X chromosomes should be um, um, silenced, having an impact on epigenetic regulation. And a recent paper by uh, Edith Hurst's lab shows that, in fact, uh, line elements play a, ma a ma major role in driving, um, in driving X chromosome inactivation in a selective manner. And this has to do with uh, expression of uh, young lines so those truncated, uh, truncated pieces of line elements, that once they are transcribed, they allow those genes that are in the, next to them to escape in inactivation, and the rest of the chromosome being then uh, uh, fully silenced by, by epigenetic mechanism. This is uh, uh, not only characteristic of cells that, uh, uh, you know, cycle or whatever, but um, this is also important apparently in somatic cells. So not just germ cells, not just early embryogenesis, but also somatic cells appear to um, regulate not only expression, but most probably also uh, mobilization of, uh, of repetitive elements. So this is a, an example provided by the lab of Fred Gage, where during uh, brain cell uh, differentiation starting from neural stem cells, what has been observed is that in a, a signal dependent manner, L1, line 1, is a, a, are transcri transcriptionally activated at specific points of the, of the differentiation process. And then these elements are not only transcribed, but they start to jump around. So at the end, this means that the mature neurons uh, have a different pattern of uh, line elements distribution in the genome then they are precursors, like the neural stem cells. And if analyzing uh, various tissues, hippocampus, cerebellum, heart, liver, and so on, and looking at <coughs> copy number variation of these elements, these are virtually uh, genetically identical, these cells. In fact, what the, the authors found is that these, all these tissues differ dramatically for the number of uh, elements being, uh, being, uh, being <coughs> present in these tissues. So there is uh, activity in somatic cells, such that these elements are moving around. This creates uh, in our basically body, in our tissues, a diversity, and like we are kind of chimeras from this point of view. 
And this, uh, this process is, uh, is uh, regulated during differentiation and most probably is part of the process that specify why cells uh, become different from one another and that gets specialized. So, uh, ourselves, we, 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 been in, we are interested very much in uh, um, skeletal muscle cell differentiation and so, some, since, since some years we've been studying the role of RNAi in this uh, respect. But we were following also the, the transcription of the line elements and sign, sign elements in this system, keeping in mind the potential impact of these transcripts in, uh, in, uh, in uh, differentiation of, uh, of, uh, of these particular cell types. So we also observed that the line elements and sign B1 elements, for example, are regulated during differentiation, such that we have a wave of transcription of line elements and sign B1 elements at the transition from myoblast myocytes into myotubes. And if we knock down such transcripts, choosing specific subfamilies of these trans trans transcripts, what we observed is a variety of phenotypes. So uh, we can deplete cells of uh, line 1 or sign B1, various subfamilies of lines, for example. And we end up with completely different phenotypes. We can kill the cells. We can accelerate differentiation. Uh, we can uh, inhibit sp specific steps of activation of genes important for, uh, for um, that, the differentiation process. But clearly, the presence of this RNA is important for correct cell viability or end differentiation. So we asked them the question whether um, uh, the transcription of these elements uh, uh, would be important also in the, in the case of Duchenne type of uh, uh, disease. It's known that this is disease is X-linked, so it has something to do with the regulation of also uh, of X chromosome or the, the dystrophy gene being present on the, on the X chromosome. The dystrophy gene happens to be the biggest gene, in, the largest gene in our genome. It's megabases, basically. And this gene is uh, full of line elements. Now, there are specific uh, classes of patients that uh, carry uh, deletions in these regions here. So namely, some, several of these line elements <coughs> will be eliminated and, uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in these patients. So we collected patients and controls and uh, asked uh, what is the uh, pattern of transcription of, uh, of repetitive elements and other non-coding RNA in these patients. So these are three patients, uh, genetically basically very similar. Uh, the age is also very, very early, so which makes them kind of a homogeneous group. Uh, we produce uh, from these uh, 36 cage libraries uh, from nucleus and cytoplasm to classify the non-coding RNA that is associated with uh, particular compartments here. And this is okay, I don't, I don't have to go into the cage uh, uh, technology here. But so what we find is that there, are, there is a global expression of repetitive elements that is clearly different between patients and, uh, and controls. So controls have a clear uh, regulation Maybe I can put it here, it's more clear. There is, a, 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 um, there is a onset of transcription at the time of, uh, uh, of differentiation. We can dissect this into, in, uh, in time. Um, and uh, this is clearly deal, dealing with uh, line transcripts or sign, line transcripts that are produced in, maintained also, kept in the nucleus, not in the cytoplasm. Now, if we compare this to uh, patients, we see that this is not taking place. So this regulated expression of line elements and most probably mobilization is completely impaired in, uh, in the patients. And these tissues are those tissues that are candidate to be uh, rapidly degenerated. So recently, uh, three papers came out telling us what, you know, what we were expecting, that these elements are in fact moving around. But these papers tell, not only that they move around, but they develop technologies that allow uh, the authors to map where these elements are jumping in the genome. Now, this is clearly still ongoing, but you can tell how many uh, hundreds, actually hundreds of copies are mobilized into each cell type 
And this mobilization is uh, uh, have taking place in somatic cells and is uh, uh, taking place, for example, during tumor, tumor progression. So we devised a tachman based uh, approach to measure the copy number uh, of line elements and, uh, in our system and ask the question whether there is a, also a copy number variation uh, in, uh, in patients versus normal individuals. And we see that the transcription defect that we saw in, uh, in patients uh, compared to the controls is uh, accompanied by uh, a change, also no change actually, in the copy number of, uh, of line elements. So normally there is a program that uh, is followed in, in normal cells for the transcription and mobilization of line elements, but this program is completely uh, impaired in, in the patients. So these cells, in fact, also in vitro, fail to differentiate properly. So you need transcription and you need mobilization of these elements to allow proper terminal differentiation of these cells. Otherwise, cells go uh, degenerate, basically. So this is a summary of all the differences. In, uh, in absolute numbers, you see that uh, the copy number variation is pretty high. We are talking about thousands of copies in normal individuals, and there is nothing going on, basically, in, in patients. Now, what about the epigenetic regulation? We are coming really to, to the end. Um, what we were, being, we were suspecting is probably true in the sense that complexes like RNAi or other aspects of epigenome regulation have a profound uh, 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 influence in the biology of uh, uh, line elements uh, retrotransposition and now we are learning also in somatic cell programming and this paper which came out like, actually I think last week tells us that MSCP2 so the methyl binding protein pretty pretty <coughs> well known is crucially important for the regulation of the line elements retrotransposition in neural cells. MSCP2 is a molecule associated with a number of uh, disease, mental retardation, diseases, and so on. And people for many years <coughs> have been looking for which genes will be deregulated in, a, uh, in cells uh, from patients affected by, the, by this kind of diseases. And none uh, of these studies has led to a clear identification of whatever gene product being prominently or specifically deregulated in these cases. Yet, pr the, the problem here seems to be more global. So saying that uh, defects in uh, uh, DNA methylation, uh, stability in th may affect the, the st um, mobilization, of, uh, mobilization rate or regulated mobilization and transcription of uh, repetitive elements having then in, uh, an impact on, uh, on, on a neural cell differentiation, hence a specific phenotype as has been observed also in patients. So, the conclusions here are that transcription and mobilization of L1 elements are enhanced during also human skeletal muscle differentiation. These events are probably regulated as part of a specific cellular program. We believe this is driven by transcription factors, basically. Um, the big question is, uh, now we have to map the integration sites in the genome to see what is the uh, direct uh, influence of a mobilization of these elements in, for example, in the vicinity of, of specific genes important for uh, terminal differentiation. And obviously functional assays for, for that matter. <coughs> now, all these are the final questions. Uh, which are the differences with, between patients and so on? Uh, and what is the role of this in, uh, in myogenic differentiation? Why this is the case, we don't know. So let me finish by thanking the people who did the work, uh, in particular two postdocs who left the lab now for the RNAi uh, stories that started from uh, silencing heterochromatin and ended up it, with the POL2 and activation regulation and stress response, uh, uh, complete adventure, and now Two, two other people, Beatrice Bodega in particular, who has been studying the role of repeat elements in muscle cell differentiation and other, and other systems. Thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to take questions.